Welcome back everybody to our class Introduction to Quantum Optics. Today we want to discuss a geometric representation of the density matrix through re three real components. And these components are the components of the so-called Bloch vector. And we'll actually find that this will give us a very visual way of interpreting any state of our density matrix of our two-level atom. And in subsequent lectures, we'll see how we can derive dynamical equations for this Bloch vector and learn how to discuss the dynamics of the two-level atom in terms of this Bloch vector, these three real components. So let's get started. So let me remind you again of the density matrix of our two-level atom. We have the populations, row 1, 1, row 2, 2, and we have the coherences, row 1, 2, and row 2, 1. Now, we know that this density matrix is emission, meaning that if we transpose it and takes the complex conjugate, it has to give the same original density matrix. And that means that our density matrix components, row 1, 1 and row 2, 2, have to be real. And the, we know that, that's of course the populations, they have to be real. And the off-diagonal components actually are linked to each other. Actually, row 2, 1 is nothing than row 1, 2 complex conjugate. So if I decompose my density matrix element row 1, 2 into a real part and imaginary part, then row 2, 1 just has to be the complex conjugate, so it's linked in this way to row 1, 2. We can write it in the same way as row 1, 2. So we can write any general density matrix in this form uh, for our two-level atom. Now, when we go to the Pauli matrices, if we look at Pauli matrices from a spin 1 half algebra, we actually already get an idea that we can, might be actually able to decompose this density matrix in terms of the Pauli matrices. So you have the sigma x Pauli matrix, the sigma y Pauli matrix, and the sigma z Pauli matrix from your spin one half system. And you see this one would kind of be able to capture the real parts of the density matrix, this one the imaginary parts, and this one somehow the populations on the diagonal. So let's see if we can really decompose it in that way. And indeed, there is a simple decomposition. You can check for yourself that any density matrix you can write in the following form as just one half times the unity matrix. So this is just 1, 0, 0, 1 here. And three components, three real components, Bx, By, Bz, multiplied by sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, that will reproduce your density matrix. Okay, and of course, Bx, Bx, Bz have to be appropriately chosen from your density matrix to, to give you the original density matrix of your system. So Bx, By, and Bz are real components uh, that you can use to decompose any state of the density matrix in terms of the Pauli matrices sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. Sometimes there's a shorthand notation that people use to describe this formula as just one half times unity matrix plus b vector times sigma vector, uh, meaning exactly this formula that we have above here. Now, when you go to the rotating frame of light, which we found to be a useful frame to describe the dynamics of the two-level atom, we introduced these rho tilde density matrices. So the rho tilde density matrix captures all the evolution of the atom apart from the time evolution of the fast oscillating light field. So we separated this fast time evolution off and looked at the residual evolution of the atomic coherences and populations. That was the rho tilde density matrix in the rotating frame of light. And we can write it in general in the following form as these rho 1 tilde and rho 2 1 tilde matrix density matrix elements. And remember, they're linked to the original density matrix elements through these e to the minus i omega t term, where this is just the frequency of light. So that's just the angular frequency of light that we introduced here. To link the rho 1, 2 density matrix tilde elements to the original rho 1, 2 density matrix elements. Now you might ask, why don't I make a tilde here on top of the Diagonal ones, well, actually row 1, 1 tilde, that's just exactly the same as row 1, 1 and row 2, 2 tilde, that's just the same as row 2, 2. Uh, the first case is trivial. The second one, actually, that just arrives just due, due to the cancellation of e to the minus i omega term with e to the i omega t terms that we get in row 2, 2 tilde, that makes it equivalent to row 2, 2. So these are actually the same as the untilded density matrix elements that we had for our row 
density matrix. Now for this tilde density matrix, uh, I can of course use the same decomposition into Pauli matrices sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And now we introduce the three components that make up the block vector u, v, and w. So they are real. All three are real components u, v, and w. And they describe the state of our rotating, of our density matrix in the rotating frame of light. Now there's a sign convention that we're using here, and note that I'm introducing these minus signs in terms of the sigma y and sigma z terms. That's just our sign convention that we're going to use in the following. If you look in a different textbook, they might be using a different sign convention. So be careful when you compare block vectors to make sure that you're actually using the same sign convention here. Now, if we use this sign convention, then the u, v, and w density matrix elements actually are very simple. The u, that's just two times the real part of row 1, 2 tilde. v is just two times imaginary part of row 1, 2 tilde. And w is what we already had before. That's the inversion row 2, 2 minus row 1, 1. u is called the dispersive component of the block vector, and v the absorptive component of the block vector. And we'll see in the, not in the next lecture why actually these are called in that way, what, what do they have to do with absorption and dispersion. Okay, so we found that we can decompose the density matrix of our two-level atom in the rotating frame of light in terms of these three real variables, u, v, and w, that allow us to describe any state of our system. Now, there are some properties this block vector has. Its length is restricted to be smaller or equal to 1. So u squared plus v squared plus w squared always are smaller or equal to 1. And you can show that if it's 1, if it's u squared plus v squared plus w squared is 1, then you actually have a pure state. Then the system is in a pure state and we don't have a mixed state for our density matrix. If it's smaller than 1, then you can actually show that it's actually the system is in a mixed state. So now we can think of as all states of the density matrix as being described uh, within a sphere of unity radius. If the state, the block vector, lies on the surface of this sphere, then it's a pure state. If it's within kind of this unity radius, then within this volume of the sphere, then actually it's a mixed state. The system is in a mixed state. So let's just think about a few states we can have. So I've drawn here this coordinate system, the u component, the v component, and the w component. Let's imagine we have a state 0, 0, 0, minus 1 of our atom. So that would correspond to a arrow block vector pointing down in this direction here, along the direction, and that would correspond to an atom in the ground state. So if the block vector points to the south pole, you're in the ground state. If the block vector points to the north pole, then you're in the excited state of our system. That's the sign convention also we chose in the system. Now think for yourself as a final question for the collecture today. If you, for example, have a block vector 1, 0, 0, corresponding to these u, v, and w components, what state, what two-level atom state does this block vector actually correspond to? Did you get it right? Okay, so that's basically everything I wanted to tell you today about how we can decompose the density matrix in the rotating frame of light in terms of the Pauli matrices and the three components that are used, u, v, and w, that one gets as the coefficients, expansion coefficients, they are the so-called Bloch vector, and they allow us to describe any state of the density matrix in this kind of sphere of unit radius. And in the next lecture, we'll actually find out the dynamical equations that cover the dynamics of this Bloch vector and how we can actually find then a very nice way of describing the dynamics using this Bloch vector. And once you've learned to think in terms of this Bloch vector, you'll see it's much easier than thinking, remembering these density matrix equations for our two-level atom. So thanks a lot for watching and see you in the next class.